So I'm not going to be able to just talk to you about my senior project today. I'm going to have to break the rules because my senior project has been so wrapped up in my whole COA journey. Um, while my studies here have been truly human ecological in the sense that they've encompassed a lot, much of my time has revolved around the issue of marine plastic pollution. Um, but before I can tell you about the nuts and bolts of my research on Frenchman Bay or the other aspects of my senior project, I'm going to have to delve into and explain the issue to you right here, right now. Um, because without the context, the project is meaningless. And now the issue is overwhelming and way more complex than I can explain in my remaining five and a half minutes, but it's important. Today we produce an annual 260 million tons of plastic. Of that, only 8.2% even embarks on its way to maybe getting recycled. The rest is put in landfills or incinerated or makes its way into the marine environment. And with that much material out there, it's no surprise that substantial amounts of it end up in the oceans. And as I'm sure you all know, the impacts are more than simply aesthetic. There's the most obvious, entanglement and synthetic line. Then there's ingestion. Cases like the whale that upon necropsy was found to have buckets of plastic sheeting occluding its stomach and intestines. Or of the albatross chick that starved with a stomach full of regurgitated lighters, bottle caps, and other plastic shards. Then two plastics have been documented as a vector for toxins, both those that are already in plastics, the chemicals added by the manufacturers, and those that they absorb from the surrounding seawater. Because plastics are oil-based, they absorb hydrophobic toxins like PCVs, PVT, and other persistent organic pollutants that bioaccumulate in animals, including us. Now, this alone is cause for serious concern, but the problem doesn't end here because unlike other ubiquitous man-made objects that have ended up in the oceans, plastics never fully biodegrade. Instead, they, they photodegrade. They break down under UV light into smaller and smaller pieces. Once they reach a very small size, these microscopic pieces break down no further. They persist unseen in the marine environment indefinitely. Um, it's this process of photodegradation and fragmentation that results in microplastics, which are most commonly defined as anything smaller than five millimeters. Now, microplastics come from the breakdown of macroplastics in the marine environment, whether it be floating litter, or the fraying of synthetic rope, or even the washing of synthetic clothing. All of our lint traps are full of microplastic, nylon, acrylic, fleece, and thus so is our wastewater. But that's not the only way that microplastics get into the marine environment because they're also being manufactured, mostly for uses in cleaners. Um, if you check the ingredients list on many exfoliating microbead face washes and even hand soaps nowadays, you can find plastic, albeit under some more cryptic name listed among the other ingredients. Um, although I, for one, have never been particularly worried about keeping my hands exfoliated. So that's how they get into the marine environment, but what are they actually doing out there? Well, to begin with, microplastics um, haven't been studied nearly as much as macroplastics. For a long time, and even to a certain degree still, the problem was simply out of sight, out of mind. But what we do know is cause for concern. Experiments have shown that planktonic organisms can and will ingest microplastic particles, and the result is often fatal. But even when it's not outright fatal, will we soon start seeing filter feeders from plankton to baleen whales that have full stomachs yet are malnourished, like we're already seeing with seabirds eating macroplastic? And of course, plastics are equal, microplastics are equally capable of absorbing those toxins. And what's scariest is that microplastics, because of their very small size, have the potential to affect the planktonic organisms that comprise the very base of the ocean's food webs. So how's that for context? I personally found all of this terrifying, which is what ultimately led for my, to my passion for researching plastics. Um, and I first researched both macro and microplastics with Sea Education Association out of Woods Hole, which is another talk. But when I returned to Maine and tried to look up past studies on microplastics specifically, I was surprised and very concerned to discover that there were no published data on microplastics in the Gulf of Maine. Um, so with the help of two grants in 2010 and 2011, I set out to study it for myself, and that was where we're starting to get towards my senior project. <laughs> um, so I collected water samples in Frenchman Bay, and you can see the sample sites there, and I got opportunistic um, offshore samples from places like Great Duck Island and Mount Desert Rock. Then back in the lab, I um, filtered the, those water samples onto a gridded filter and then put that under a dissecting scope so that I could count the number of microplastic pieces present. Um, and I've compiled some photos here so that you can see what those microplastics look like. They come in a number of colors um, and they're very filamentous in nature. 
So I found, in terms of my overall findings, I found that there was a ton of variability in abundance and distribution of those um, sample and of microplastic in those samples. But I did find that there was microplastic in 98% of samples. Um, averaging 66 pieces of microplastic per liter of seawater, ranging from zero pieces to a staggering 488 pieces of microplastic in one liter of water. So this is where my senior project finally comes in, is processing and analyzing and writing up all of this data, and that's a big important part of my senior project. But what it really comes down to is that all of this data is meaningless without disseminating it, and not only to the scientific community, but also to the broader public, because after all, it's all of us that are purchasing those thousands of tons of single-use disposable and frankly needless pla plastic packaging. Um, so the other aspects of my senior project have um, involved education in a number of forms. There's actually a display over in Take a Break, our dining hall, that conveys a lot of what you just heard and saw. Um, and there are a whole bunch of other educational components. But what's in terms of what's in the future for me, I plan to keep studying um, plastics and also educating about plastics. Um, and I'm also working towards my captain's license, so for part of the summer I will be crewing on a boat that is circumnavigating Newfoundland. So with that, I'd love to thank all of the people that helped me with this project, and let me take some questions if we have them. I'm thinking all age ranges. I think this is important for everybody to know. And I've, I've given talks to high school students and middle school students, but I'm also hoping to design things for all age ranges. I mean, I'm talking to you here now, so <laughs> I think now I have pretty much all of the age ranges. That's a great question. What I was studying here, the microplastics, are all surface. They were all surface samples. Um, either, generally, either plastics float or they sink. So either you're doing surface or benthic studies. And most of the studies that currently are surface studies because it's a lot easier and because a lot of plastics do float. Thank you. Thank you.